have been talking about surface generation, right? So, last time we actually looked at methods of displaying uh, surfaces in terms of its representation, right. So, parametric surfaces could possibly be rendered by either breaking them into piecewise linear or coplanar elements, right, or you have subdivision of the, of the parametric surfaces. <coughs> right. So, what we looked at basically a polygonal representation of objects right. and the uh, motivation to have polygonal representation are could be various and one of the main motivation is that the rendering of polygons in general <coughs> is hardware supported. Right. So, when we will talk about uh, shading or rendering of polygons, then we will discuss more in details. So, uh, on and also for the for the uh, acquisition of data from various scanners, right. So, you primarily get the point clouds for which you establish the connectivity and form triangles or any polygons. So, that is the kind of data for which you would like to again use a polygonal representation, right. So, so what we basically looked at is that if there is an object of this kind, it could actually be made of several surfaces. So, in this case there is a surface which is the sides of the object and then there are caps of the cylinder, right. And each of these surface in turn could be represented as polygons or collection of polygons right, which we refer to as polygonal mesh. So, this is represented using several polygons and this top and bottom are again represented by polygons right. And often for the purpose of simplicity we use triangles as polygons because we can always break down the polygons into triangles and computations on triangles are again more efficient right. So, what we basically looked at uh, various ways of uh, representing data pertaining to these polygons or the polygonal meshes the data structure which is required. So, the first type we looked at was, so yeah when we are talking about polygonal representation we are looking at representation of the edges which connect the vertices and the polygons which again is a sequence of edges right that is what we mean by. Okay. So, <coughs> the explicit representation we looked at is basically a the way of representing a polygon as collection of individual vertices to form that polygon and you write it in a sequence. So, that the last edge which will get formed is between the last point and the first point right. So, that information is there right. So, each of these vertices is given explicitly coordinates of each of those right. So, the limitation of such a representation is that the re manipulation for such a polygonal mesh is restricted right. If you want to let us say delete a point or you know uh, delete an edge right. So, you need to get more information so that you can localize your manipulation. In this case it is very difficult right. So, you will have to again reform the whole list of vertices to get the polygon right. So, we looked at uh, let us say incremental enhancement to this representation which is explicit representation to add this facility of manipulation. Right. So, the next which we looked at was basically a pointer to a vertex list which is very 
commonly used. So, what we have is a table of vertices where all the coordinates which are used for defining the mesh are listed right in this manner. So, it is just a table and then you have polygon is just as a reference to that table right the entry reference to that table. So, which could be like V 1, V 2, V 3 these are just the index numbers like in this case if I have P 1. So, it is just 1, 2, 4 these are the entry in the table. Now, again this representation although facilitates some manipulations onto the mesh, but if I am interested in finding out what are the polygons which are shared by an edge right it is difficult to answer because I will have to actually go through the entire list to be able to derive this information right. So, what we do is we try to modify this data structure where we facilitate this manipulation right and also there is also there is a notion of <coughs> redundancy right. In the last representation what we looked at the explicit representation there were lot there was lots of redundancy points were repeated just to be able to define an individual polygon right. So, that is another uh, parameter or aspect for deciding your data structure you want to use. So, uh, now in order that we facilitate the let us say the adjacency information right to get the information about what are the polygons shared by an edge we modify the data structure which is sort of edge based and we build a edge list right. So, where an edge is defined in terms of the two vertices it joins and the polygons which are shared by this edge right. So, the whole information is there right and then the polygon is nothing but in case of triangle is a collection of three edges which constitute the polygon right. So, in this case if I am interested in uh, finding out polygon P 1 it is nothing but E 1, E 4, E 5 right and similarly the individual edge here E 1 is defined through the point V 1, V 2 the polygon which is shared since there is only one polygon here I just write P 1 and for the other polygon I just say null right. So, in a way it also gives you an information if I am interested in finding out the boundary of the polygonal mesh right. If somebody asks you to find out with through this representation what is the boundary of the polygonal mesh it is very easy you just scan the edge list right and find out what are the edges which are shared by only one polygon right and you have the answer right. A slight variation could also be done if I am also interested in finding out holes right hole is also a some sort of a boundary maybe you need to have an orientation in which you traverse the edge the, the list right. right. So, in order to distinguish between hole and a boundary right. So, you can always get hole and boundary using this data structure fine and then again the problem is that if I am interested in finding out let us say more information in terms of what are the edges incident on a vertex right. So, more adjacency information that is again difficult to find out I will have to again traverse through the entire data structure. So, for that we looked at another data structure which was winged edge data structure right. So, where the information was added also about the auxiliary edges to the vertices right. So, there is an edge A let us say for which the data structure is written which is defined between x and y and you also have additional information about the edges which you get 
through the traversal of the polygons shared by this H A, right. So, for instance, you have information about the pre predecessor H, right, for the polygon which is obtained by left traversal and the succeeding H D, right. So, do through this, now if you are interested in finding out the edges which are incident on a vertex is relatively easy. You do not have to travel through all the mesh, right. So, again the, the overhead which you pay it is in terms of the information you store. So, the data structure becomes heavier. Vertices, the vertex which will which we will encounter while. No, so what we are trying to do is we are trying to actually derive some sort of a navigational scheme, right. So, I go from here to here. So, I have a notion of how I am traversing the these edges in a polygon. So, if I look at from this side, I, I actually go in a clockwise manner, and so is the case here, right. So, my traversal is always clockwise about a polygon, right. And I am again basing my data structure on edge, right. This, this is the connective connectivity link between points that is what establishes the connectivity of a of a mesh, right. So, I just travels through that and I can derive information about the polygons which would be adjacent to an edge or shared by that edge, right. And also in case for a particular and I also have the explicit information about what vertices the edge constitutes, right. So, x to y I know that. The, in, the additional information if I am interested at any point of time, for instance getting the edges which would possibly be incident here on this vertex. Right, just the traversal scheme would give me the information about the <coughs> edges here, because this edge is given by this traversal, this edge is given by this traversal. So, from here now I can go to the other traversal, right, this polygon and so on. So, the number of polygons or edges which I need to traverse is limited, it is not a function of the number of edges in the mesh, right. So, in some sense it is again constant time, right, ok. So, so that is what we had discussed last time. Now, uh, now what we will do is we will basically look at the the uh, models which can get formed using the combination of surfaces. Now, what are we trying to do? Ultimately, we are building these models which could possibly be the solids, right. So, we have the solids constructed using the surfaces which are the boundaries of that solid, right. So, eventually if we are if we are doing this CAD CAM kind of a application, right. So, we deal with solids, right, and surfaces could be the boundary representations of those solids. So, let us say if I have a representation for solid models using surfaces uh, as its boundaries, then let us say I try to make this solid models using wireframe representation. So, when I am talking about wireframe representation, I am looking at two data structures or let us say two kind of information which would give me the vertices which are there in the solid and, and how those vertices are connected, right. So, only the connectivity of points, right. So, in this case let us say if I have an object of this kind the cuboid then all I am having the information as these 
vertices 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 right the red dots and these links right and I render them using only these links right now uh, is there a problem such a with such a representation see this is the way I am going to display it right using the links of the vertices. Now the question is uh, is there any problem with this? Are you not sure if, if a surface exists at some place? Or? Right. So in some sense it, is, it could be ambiguous right. So for instance let me give you an example. See let us say if I have a wireframe representation which is given like this right. The only thing I have the information about the links joining to the various points right. Then this could be like this, this could be like this and this could be like this right. So, there is lots of ambiguity about what do I see from here right. So, just having the information about the vertices which are giving you the boundary of a solid and the respective links is inadequate right to be able to know what that solid could possibly be there right. So, now what we are looking at is some better boundary representation right. In fact, the polygonal representation is also a boundary representation which we had already seen. So, what we are trying to say that we will have now three elements vertices, edges and faces right. In a more generalized sense these edges could be curves and these faces could be surfaces right. But we need information about these right. So, to resolve the ambiguity of a solid. Now, when we are talking about these boundary representations for, for solids, often we actually consider those boundary uh, for the solids which are manifolds right. What do I mean by manifolds? It is basically some sort of a well behaved solid right. It is a it's just a qualitative notion. Uh, mathematically what we what we are trying to say there is that it should satisfy some condition so that I have the surface which is a manifold right and that condition is basically that for each point if I consider on the surface it is a point x. So, there exists an open ball, open ball means some sort of a sphere with the center x right which let us say is defined using a very small radius some r. So, that the intersection of this ball and the surface can be continuously deformed to form an open disk ok. So, then I, I have the, the boundary or the surface is manifold or sometimes also called as two manifold right. So, let me give you the example to be able to appreciate what I said. So, here is an example of a cuboid right which is two manifold. What I consider let us say at location 2, I define a an open ball a spherical ball right the center of which is some point x which is on the surface. 
fine. Now, what do I see which I get as an intersection of this to the surface of this boundary is a disk which is given here with the red right that is what I mean by the open disk right. Now, so this should happen everywhere when I said open disk which is which you get it after some deformation also right. So, it should be possible to get an open disk even using some deformations right that is what I need. Now, let us say if I consider here at the edge right I embed this open ball. Now, if I look at, at this location this is what you will see right this is nothing but some sort of a bent disk right which I can again twist it right to get the open disk fine. Let us say if you go to this corner right again when you see the the intersection of this this open ball with the surface here at this point you get again the three fold kind of a disk right again you can turn it or twist it right to get the open disk right. So, all we are saying is that we should be able to get after let us say some deformation an open disk when I embed a an open ball that is what is the condition for two manifold right. Now, let us see when we do not have such a condition and that is what we do not call it as two, mani two manifold is something here in this. So, here when you look at what you find is this right. So, what you get here in fact two disks right and you can get a, an open disk only by gluing them together right not by deforming the same disk right. So, that we consider is a violation of that condition right. So, this is not a two manifold. So, uh, many of the models which are generally considered for modeling are manifolds. Right. Now, uh, let us take some more uh, examples where we will be able to have these boundary representation for the solid models. So, these are some simpler examples are polyhedra or poly, polyhedral objects right. So, these polyhedra are multifaceted 3D solid bounded by a finite connected set of plane polygons such that every edge of each polygon belongs also to just one other polygon. So, you have the edge which is shared by exactly two polygons that is what it says right. So, some of the examples are this you have this. So, again you can have both convex and non convex polyhedra right. So, these are the examples of convex polyhedra and this is the example of non convex or concave polyhedra right. But if you look at each of these edge it is exactly shared by two polygons right. So, what are the elements which we use for defining a polyhedra we have a vertex we have the edge and we have the face 
that is what we need also for boundary representation of a solid. And we also have the angle which is formed at the edge between the two faces of the polygon, which we call it as the hadral angle. Right. So, this these are the elements for defining a polyhedra. Now, uh, so you have some special kind of polyhedra which you might be also familiar with. So, there are regular polyhedra which requires for certain conditions to be imposed, which are that all faces are regular and congruent right and the dihedral angles are equal right. So, the examples of these regular polyhedra are tetrahedron cube, octahedron, dodecahedron, icosahedron. So, these are also called as the five platonic solids. see if I have. So, I have an example which I took it from somewhere. So, you have this tetrahedron right. So, you see that the face of a tetrahedron is actually a triangle right and there are four faces right the tetra number of total number of faces. This is cube you are familiar with it. This is octahedron right. So, here we have the type of the face polygon is triangle right and we have 8 faces right. So, each of the polygon when you see they are regular and congruent. and the dihedral angles are same. Similarly, you have dodecahedron right for which you have the number of total number of faces as 12 and this is icosahedron you have 20 right total number of faces. So, these are also called as platonic solids right. So, so these are uh, some special polyhedra right. Now, uh, <coughs> there are also some polyhedron which we call it as simple polyhedron. So, a simple polyhedron is uh, can be actually deformed into a sphere or we also call it as homomorphic to sphere. That means, I can stretch just consider that solid or a polyhedron like a deformable elastic type of a material and which you can deform to form a sphere right. Now, there is a certain uh, property which is maintained if you have a simple polyhedron. And that is given through what is called as Euler formula. So, there is a relationship between the number of vertices, the number of edges, and the number of faces which define a simple polyhedron. And this relationship is given here V is the number of vertices, E is the number of edges, and F is the number of faces. So, if I take V minus E plus F it turns out to be 2 for simple polyhedron right. So, so this is actually a, a necessary condition to have uh, a simple polyhedron defined, but there are other conditions which need to be satisfied. So, that you have the solid defined. So, for instance, you need to have additional conditions such as 
each edge must connect two vertices and it can be shared by two faces and at least three edges must meet at each vertex right and faces must not interpenetrate okay so these are additional conditions for you to have the definition of a solid now let's see see uh, an example where this Euler number the relationship of V E and F we observe satisfying right. So, here is an example. So, you have a cube again right. So, where, where we have the number of vertices as 8, number of edges 12 and number of faces as 6 right. So, if you just consider this V minus E plus F you get 2 right and you basically can see this as getting deformed into a sphere right. You, you see consider like sphere in a very uh, coarse resolution right it could be possibly look like a like a cuboid right. So, similarly you have for tetrahedral which is also a simple polyhedra the condition of Euler number getting satisfied and there is another example right. Now, let us say so we have not considered what we have not considered that the the polyhedra which are which we are considering does not have holes on its faces right and there is not hole through and through in the object right it is a closed surface solid right. Now, let us try to uh, see what happens if we consider them. So, there is a generalization of the Euler's number where you can also incorporate the holes which are there on the faces right. The number of holes that pass through the object and often refer to as the genus of the object right. So, for instance sphere has a genus 0, torus has a genus right that is what we mean here and C is the number of connected components fine. So, if you want to incorporate this information then the Euler number is modified like this ok. So, again giving you an example let us say I have a solid like this right. So, this is a through and through hole and this is just a hole at the top right. So, it is not a through and through hole right. So, now if I count the total number of vertices comes out as 24, number of edges is 36, number of faces is 15. Now, the number of holes, number of holes on the faces is 1, 2, 3 right the connected component is 1 whole thing is connected right and genus is 1 there is one hole which is through the object right. So, if I substitute this information there I should get the left hand side is equal to right hand side. So, in this case it turns out to be 0 right on both the sides. Right. Okay. So, so these are some let us say examples of polyhedral objects right their elements and the property captured using Euler number. Now, there is something else which can also be used for representing solids or let us say designing solids 
or constructing solids. So, there is something called as constructive solid geometry, which is in short form also called as CSG. Right. So, a CSG solid is basically constructed using a few primitives and some Boolean operators which are performed on those, those primitives. Right. So, for instance you can consider primitives like cube, prism, sphere, cylinder, cone etcetera. Right. The Boolean operators are nothing but the simple set operations which you are familiar with. Right. For example, difference, union, intersection. Right. So, the idea here is that you can construct a fairly complicated solid model using collection of these primitives and some Boolean operations on those primitives. Right. Again, it, it has a lots of application in CAT CAM. Right. So, let me illustrate here what do I mean by this. So, let us say if I have a uh, if I have two primitive let us say primitive of cylinder. So, A is this B is this right there is one horizontal cylinder and there is one vertical cylinder. These are the two primitives I consider right. So, a simple set theoretic operations for instance union would give me something like this and it is a useful solid right. We see in many mechanical parts such a component right which is built only by a simple Boolean operation of two primitives. Similarly, I can construct A intersection B which would be like this. This is A minus B and this is B minus B. Right. So, this is another way of constructing complex solids just by applying Boolean operations to simple primitives. Right. So, in fact, when we uh, do ray tracing, we will deal with rendering these CSG models. Okay. Because here what you need to also consider what is the interior of the solid, what is the closure of the solid, what is the exterior of the solid to be able to decide that this is the part you are going to render. Right. And ray tracing that does that by the process of getting the visible operate visible points. Right. So, ray tracing does it inherently this operation. So, we will look at it more carefully when we talk about ray tracing. Right. So, uh, just to further illustrate let us say if you are interested in getting this and right, that is what you want as an end end model of the solid right. So, there is this block here there is another block and there is a hole in this block right. So, you can start with these primitives right where you consider this block 1 block 2 and then there is a cylinder here right. So, all it requires you to have certain transformation of these primitives and perform the Boolean operations. Right. So, what you do is you, you translate these blocks to be able to get into this configuration right where this is block 1, this is block 2 all it requires is a translation right and then you may also do a translation of this cylinder such that it goes at this location right then all you need to do is here you need to perform the difference whereas here you need to perform the union 
right. So, the total transformation which you need to be able to get this particular solid is a union of translated block 1, block 2 with the translated cylinder right which gives you this and then you take the difference of these two right. Now, uh, is it unique? The CSG representation is not unique, right. You can construct this in different ways, right. So, now looking at this as a chain of transformation accompanied with the Boolean operations, I can actually represent this as a some sort of a tree, right. So, this operation I can actually write where the leaf here is the primitive, the <coughs> intermediate nodes are some transformation or Boolean operation. Right. So, here you have some transformation like a translation and here you have a Boolean operation right and the root of this whole thing is your solid the object of interest right. So, I can actually look this as a tree structure to construct the solid. All right. Now, uh, so this is basically what we wanted to look at as the solid models. Right. Now, there are other uh, representations also. Uh, for instance, you can also consider solids to be collection of volumetric elements. Right. So, those representations we are not going to consider here, maybe at some later stage. Right. So, there in fact, what we are saying is that just like an image is a collection of several dots of pixels, right. Similarly, a solid is collection of some volumetric elements called voxels, right. So, it is a complete discrete representation of collection of those voxels, right. So, uh, those are useful when we want to do volumetric manipulation, volume rendering and so on, right. So, those we are not dealing with here. Now, uh, just this tree structure which is basically a collection of transformations and Boolean operations also inspires us what is you will have the assignment which we have already discussed. See tree structure is also giving you a notion of hierarchical modeling where certain primitives are coupled with the transformations to define your final model right. So, that is what we are going to look at just to give you a sketch of it and then we will talk about the details of your assignment next time. In fact, this is uh, a part of the rendering pep pipeline which we had seen earlier right, where the interest only is to form a scene or form your world right before you perform the viewing transformations and so on right. So, here the idea is that if you are trying to build a scene which is nothing but collection of houses right. Then you can look at the primitives which would build parts of the model of the model right. So, here you have a some sort of a prism here, here you have some sort of a cuboid here right which will get some modeling transformation to be applied 
to form this right so an individual house could basically be constructed using a primitive right a simplified model and a transformation right so once you have got let's say model of house then again you can get various instances of this house using again set of transformations you can have a bigger house smaller house wider house thinner house and so on and build a whole colony of houses right so this shows some sort of a hierarchy in the modeling process right so what we are looking at is some sort of a graph right directed day cyclic graph dag which will have the leaves as leaves as uh, the simple primitive objects for the model right these edges are the transformations again we get a some aggregated model right again using some transformations we build our world or scene right so a scene can basically be defined in terms of a graph or a tree right where the nodes could have a simpler model right and that simpler model can can again be decomposed into its primitive elements right and then you you build whole hierarchy of your model right so for instance when we are dealing with the design of a car right so there will be several primitives for your model which could be built as a hierarchy right so you can construct one wheel and then build the rest of the wheels right and similarly if you want to have symmetric sides then you build one side and take a reflection of that right so eventually what you are doing is you are using combination of model primitives and the transformations to build the entire scene right so we'll talk more about this in the context of your assignment right and uh, so you will also see some mm, some of the uh, let's say prototypical models for the car which we which which uh, i want you to build and if you want to uh, make some specific model there are also sites available for the measurements which will which will also be announced along with the assignment which you can see and build a specific model right so start working on it otherwise things are going to be hard okay thank you Thank <laughs> you.